Hi everyone, my name is Zach Bartenslager and I'm the Extension Associate for Youth Livestock Programs in the state of Kentucky. Hope everyone is doing well. Today we will be going over sheep evaluation, which is the second video in our webinar series that covers the basics of livestock evaluation. Before we dive into some of the sheep evaluation material that I have, I want to make sure that we cover again the object objectives that we have for this webinar series. We're identifying priorities as it pertains to species, specifically sheep evaluation today. And then we're also trying to enhance our evaluation methods by looking for specific markers or different things that perhaps can help us in sorting animals over one another. Before we dive into our priorities as it pertains to breeding sheep, I thought first that we'd start off with talking about industry fundamentals, specifically because the sheep industry is so highly segmented. And when I say the word segmented, I mean that there's a divide or maybe there's two different aspects within the industry that we need to talk about. I'll note that neither one of these are right or wrong or anything in between. Certainly there's different uh, uh, niches that producers will gear towards and that's perfectly fine. I just want to bring it up for us within the livestock ju judging world as something to think about and know that these type of breeding sheep can be brought forth to us and that we know, need to know how to react to them and even know what they look like just so that we have that in the back of our mind as we start to evaluate them and, and know what they stand for. So let's talk first about the purebred or performance side where sheep with either seed stock or commercial targets are being bred for and more specifically we'll see them having lateness of maturity and growth as huge factors for us to consider as well. Basically these are frame type sheep. These are sheep that are being used for for a little extra growth, a little extra performance in them. We'll see them having a lot of height of shoulder a lot of length of body, just very tall in terms of their stature, and a lot of times it takes them a little bit longer to get to that mature uh, body type or whatever you might uh, want to describe that as, uh, but basically they're bigger type sheep. Again, nothing wrong with that. That's just uh, the way that they're bred for and, and, and that meets the markets that, that they're trying to hit. On the other side of that is a uh, weather type sheep. A lot of times you'll hear them referred to as weather dams and specifically within the judging uh, ring you'll hear them described as weather dams. Uh, these are sheep that are targeted for the production of show weathers and so with that will come more terminal and extreme type pieces that are being bred for and are used as points of consideration as well. These sheep are going to look a little bit smaller in terms of their stature and size, although we'll talk about maybe how that's shifting a little bit right now. But in general, we want them to be able to fill out into their body type and have more uh, extreme in terms of their rib shape and their pin set and just their muscle pattern in general. And so in order for us to do that, a lot of times we think about them being smaller in terms of size or frame, however you want to describe that. Again. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's just the uh, niche uh, market that they're trying to hit, uh, trying to produce uh, show weathers. One thing that I, I want to bring out uh, is that when we think about this from a livestock judging perspective, weather dams is oftentimes confused as being as people thinking that these are weather sheep, and, and that's not the case. These are ewes that are brought out to you and that are being asked to be judged as breeding animals but we're thinking about them for the production of show weathers. So again, it's a breeding animal, but we're thinking about them being geared more towards a, a certain segment within the industry. So to give an example of this, I pulled two pictures off the internet of uh, two sheep that are two rams that are, are, are very uh, Hampshire indicative in terms of the way that they look. Uh, their breed character and so on and so forth. I definitely have that influence, but probably uh, are very different in terms of their body type though. Uh, if you look at the one on the left, a uh, ram that's taller at his shoulder, long in terms of his body, and you can even look at the, that depth of rib that we talked about uh, in our last video, 
look there, maybe just a little bit shallower and, and maybe not as much there. Uh, maybe just a sheep that doesn't look to be filled out as much and that lateness and maturity or, or that time that it takes to fill out in their body, uh, maybe just a little bit longer. And so we can think about that being a frame sheep or a sheep that's being bred for more of the seed stock industry or even the commercial industry as well. You can see a good sheep though, nothing wrong with that sheep, uh, just the way that that one's presented and brought forth to us. A lot of times on, on frame sheep as well, uh, we'll see them where they've been fitted out, uh, meaning that those sheep uh, are, are still got a lot of wool on them and have just been kind of clipped in with hand shears uh, to look a certain way to kind of box them in and, and highlight some of their attributes. On the right hand side here, uh, you'll see again uh, one that's got some Hampshire influence in him, but he looks a lot different in how he's presented, right? He's even kind of slicked off in terms of his appearance. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of times uh, those that are on the more weather type sheep uh, will think about them being slicked off in their appearance. Uh, and those sheep are just a little bit shorter, smaller to the ground. And you can see that the rib shape and muscle pattern starts to look a lot different in them. The bone size looks a lot different in them as well. A lot more kind of extreme type pieces to them. Maybe not as big, not as, uh, as long in terms of their pattern. Again, nothing wrong with that at all. Just kind of highlights the fact that they're producing for specific uh, niche market for those show weathers that we talked about. So you can see the difference between the two. I try to find two that were similar in terms of uh, the breed that they come from, but yet how they've been bred differently for a specific segment within the industry. It's very, very important that you can find that and highlight that and, and, and think about it as, you know, how are you going to use it towards uh, getting the class placed correctly and also maybe in, in implementing it into a set of reasons as well. Uh, those are just two examples right there. Even though we just talked about how highly segmented the breeding sheep industry truly is, it's still important to keep in the back of our mind that priorities that we have for all breeding sheep no matter what part of the industry they're involved in. Those priorities are functionality first, muscle second, and balance third. Now, if you think back to last week when we were talking about breeding cattle and breeding animals in general, you'll remember those are our priorities that we keep in the back of our mind no matter what species that we're looking at. Hopefully, these priorities that we just listed off will start to become second nature to you as you evaluate animals. Function is our first priority in breeding sheep. When we think about function, we must talk about structural integrity. Just as we spoke last week with beef cattle, that structural integrity plays a role with longevity within the herd, the same could be said with sheep and their longevity within the flock. If we think about angles on a sheep, they're very similar to that of beef cattle in the sense that at the top of their shoulder, coming down to the point of their shoulder, needs to have a nice 45 degree slope or angle. If that happens, we can see a gentle roll at their knee and then down into their pastern. And if we study their front end assembly, everything should look strong and tie in well at the top of their shoulder. And when they move, their head and neck should stay in an upright position. Additionally, in sheep, it's very important that we study them from the top of their shoulder back out through their hip for a nice level, strong slope that they have carrying down their top line. From there, we want to come down to their hock and into their pastern for a nice gentle roll and slope that gives them an attractive look to their hind leg set. If all of this happens, most of the time that animal will look like it has an uphill type look, meaning that sheep looks like it runs uphill from its hip back up to the top of its shoulder and gives an elegant type of look to the side. I say all this for the sheep on the far left having a very attractive silhouette and a good build from a structural integrity standpoint. If we come to the sheep on the far right here, I still think a sheep that has some structural parts that are okay, but if we study her from the top of her shoulder back out to the point of her shoulder, she gets just kind of long in terms of her blade. I still think she has a 45 degree slope or pretty close to that 
but she gets this kind of long in terms of her shoulder blade, which we'll talk about from a structure standpoint or from a balance standpoint, excuse me, later on. Additionally, we want to change her in terms of her front feet placement. Looks like she just kind of displays out there and in turn will start to open up in her shoulder blade. And even if we study her front end assembly, if we come down in her neck and down into her shoulder attachment, we can see how it starts to make a U-type shape there and where we get some extra folds there. And that's simply because her neck ties in low to the point of her shoulder. If we study her down her top line, there's a gentle type roll there. It just doesn't have the strength of top line that we saw on the sheet to the far left. If we study her in terms of her hind leg set, she has plenty of slope and roll in terms of her hock and into her pastern, but perhaps there's just too much set there and in turn will make her weak in terms of her rear leg placement as time goes on. Again, not a sheet that I think is too far gone from a structure standpoint, simply things that we need to change and alter in her to make her ideal like the one on the far left. Another important part of function within breeding sheep is roundness of rib. If you listened to last week's video, you heard the importance of fleshing ability within cattle. And although I think that sheep need to have some flesh to them as well, I think more important now is that they need to have roundness of rib. If we study the two sheep that are presented on this slide, the sheep on the far left gives us a very good uh, illusion of what it means to have roundness of rib. If we study the ewe right in behind her shoulder, we can have we can see, start to see somewhat of a round or, or rounded type shape to her rib cage that comes the whole way back to the last rib on that particular ewe. We want to study this for the duration of the rib cage, and just as importantly, we want to study them back out through their hip and down to the base of their skeleton as well. Sheep that have some roundness to their rib will naturally open up with just a wider foundation. In turn, most of the time, they'll have some depth to their flank and softness to their body, which is also desirable, but more importantly, we want to see for that internal volume that roundness of rib that's so uh, desired or important within the sheep industry. Again, the sheep on the far left, I think, gives a very good illusion of that. If we study the, the ewe on the far right, we can see she has plenty of depth of body. And although I think that's still a, an ideal type thing or, or something that's getting close to ideal, she still needs to have that roundness of rib. And if we study her right in behind her shoulder, down to the bottom of her rib cage, it just doesn't come as much curve there. If we come back to her last rib, the same could be said, and this is still evident, if we come back out through her hip and down to the base of her skeleton. She just doesn't have that natural internal dimension or volume that perhaps the sheep on the far left has uh, that gives that kind of roundness of body or roundness of rib. Again, example, uh, and we want to still make sure they have some fleshing ability to them, but more important than that is that we want to make sure they have the roundness of rib that's desired. Other points of consideration for function and breeding sheep are listed below, and a lot of times, especially in a livestock judging setting, uh, we'll see this as something maybe we can talk about from a reasons perspective, but really not as much from a placing perspective. And it's important that you uh, study the rules uh, before you go into the contest or have your coach explain some of those rules to you as well uh, so that you can understand what you're getting yourself into. But, uh, you know, breed character is something that a lot of times will be brought up on purebred sheep, uh, something that, you know, is a point of consideration for reasons, but not a placing factor. We want to make sure that those animals represent the breed uh, and their character of the breed uh, to the highest degree and, and are ideal in terms of what they look like. We also think a lot of times on sheep about mouse. Uh, you'll see that a lot of times of being something that we need to pay attention to from a reasons perspective, but again, not a placing standpoint. Uh, and then on, on you know rams, we'll see scrotums brought up as well. I even gave us an image there on the far right of some different examples we can see on sheep. Uh, in terms of their mouths. So a lot of times we'll see sheep uh, with parrot mouth, uh, that image that's there, the, the first image that I'll circle here for you. Uh, and when they have a parrot mouth, you can think about that 
uh, top part of their mouth is kind of overshooting the bottom part of their mouth where you can see there's just a, a, a slight overlap there on the on the top portion um, compared to what should be uh, they can have monkey mouth you probably don't see that as much uh, but you definitely will see some parrot mouth every now and then in breeding sheep if we think about why that can be so detrimental we can think about it from the standpoint that you know uh, maybe feed intake can be limited or where that feed will drop out and just having some issues from an efficiency standpoint so again some things to think about uh, other points of consideration from a function standpoint uh, but not necessarily something that'll get help you uh, place one animal over another one so our second priority in breeding sheep is muscle and really there's not much difference at all in muscle uh, across species and again it starts at their foundation of how wide they are in their foundation which will in turn allow for muscle up high and you know I just put an image up here of one that's really muscular and again I, I want to make sure to emphasize that they've got to be opened up and square and they're built down low in order for them to have muscle up high Can, continue to think about that we want to read them in terms of base width first we want to come behind their shoulder and read them in terms of just how wide they are behind their shoulder and, and from their back and kind of that last place we're going to look and, and, and make sure that they have plenty of muscle is there at their hip and that's kind of the verification for us of yeah we're, they're a muscular animal or they have enough muscle or no maybe they need slight a uh, slight amount more so anyways those are things to think about again we want them to be muscular we're going to see variations in muscle from frame sheep to more uh, weather type sheep regardless of what we're looking at though they've got to be square in their build and they've got to have the right amount of muscle to them as well they've got to be adequate in terms of muscle for us to be able to go to that next priority of balance our final priority in breeding sheep is balance we talked last week about balance and, and the importance that it plays and not really just in the show ring but also the tie that it has to structural integrity and a lot of times what we think uh, from that standpoint you know balance uh, is something that sometimes can be somewhat subjective and I think in the sheep industry uh, you know there's going to be variations of that as well especially when we think about uh, sheep within the different sectors that they might belong in uh, but I put up two sheep here one on the far right is a little more weather type sheep on the far left is a more frame type sheep and regardless of that both of those sheep are very well balanced if we think about it they have to be tall on their shoulder they have to be level in their top line they have to be proportional in terms of their build some depth of flank to them really the U on the far right does a really good job in terms of depth of flank uh, having some bone size to them having some length of neck and just really everything kind of comes together in a proportional manner Females need to look like females. Uh, the ewes need to look like ewes and have an elegant look to them. And, uh, you know, the males, uh, rams, they need to look like rams. They need to be stout and muscular, but still have a balanced, uh, symmetrical type look to them. So, again, those are two are very uh, different in what they stand for, but both I would consider very well balanced, very proportional in terms of their look. A uh, very good image of what we need to be looking for in balance in breeding sheep. One last thing I'd like to talk about with breeding sheep before we head into to market lambs is that a lot of times we'll be given data, and although we're not specifically talking about data today, or really for any species, I think it's important for us to hit some genetic abnormalities that can be thrown our way on that data sheet as it pertains to breeding sheep. And so, um, I just want to go through those real quick. Code on 171 scrapie is what we'll see most of the time on that breeding sheet or on the data sheet, excuse me. Um, that's an infectious disease uh, that we can think about that will um, affect the nervous system. Really, um, we need to understand what those letters are that are thrown out to us so oftentimes and how do we implement that in, in making a decision. I put up here on the right uh, a diagram of, of the, um, the letters that we'll see a lot of times and, and we'll talk about what it means. And so if we think about RR, we think about that being an animal that is clean or free of the scrapie gene, meaning they have 
no evidence of that. Uh, they're not susceptible to be able to uh, to endure scrapie at any point in their life. Uh, they're free of that gene. Uh, RR is a good thing. Um, we also can have sheep that express a QR. Uh, QR means that they're a carrier of the gene. It doesn't mean that they're going to express the gene. It does not mean that they're going to uh, be susceptible to scrapie, uh, but it does mean that they carry the gene and that they can pass it on to the next generation. QQ means that not only do they carry the gene, but then also uh, that they can be susceptible to scrapie later on in their life. And so QQ is a bad thing. Uh, something that uh, can really affect the sheep from a nervous system standpoint. And so when we think about when we start mating them up, you can see some different expressions here of how we mate those uh, those genes, those animals together and what can happen. You know, for instance, uh, our first diagram there where we have a U that's QR, meaning she just carries a gene. She's not uh, susceptible to scrapie. And where we have a ram that carries the gene as well, he's QR. And we can see that 25% of the time, they're going to have offspring that they're mated together uh, that will come out QQ, meaning that they'll be susceptible to scrapie later on in their life. Um, we also will have 50% of the time where they're QR, that just meaning uh, that they're going to carry the gene just like their mother and father, just their sire and dam. Uh, and then also 25% of the time, they'll come out clean. Uh, they'll come out totally resistant, uh, won't carry the gene at all. So uh, you can work your way through that progression there, but I wanted to throw that up because we see that a lot of times on data sheets, uh, just something we need to know what it is uh, and how producers breed around it or, or try to avoid some of the uh, detriment that it can bring to a flock and also how do we utilize it in a livestock judging setting. And so again, you'll have to read your scenario and think about it and how we're gonna be mating animals up. Um, but for the most part, we wanna think about those animals being clean in terms of their blood type uh, so that they're not able to uh, be susceptible uh, or pass on that gene for animals to be susceptible later on in life. Spider gene, uh, we can think about that being a skeletal deformity, um, and, and that's not as often that we'll see spider gene uh, put on um, put on a data sheet for us, but it can from time to time. Uh, we'll see that expressed as clean uh, animal. It's clean that does not have uh, any of the spider gene as NN. Uh, an animal, a, a sheep that carries the gene is NS. And then uh, an animal that has spider um, and is dead is SS, and they'll be born dead, or if they're not born dead, then um, they'll be pretty close to it and will have to be put down. So that's something we can think about. Uh, hairy lamb gene, we'll see that from time to time as well. A lot of times on South Downs, we'll see this where just a, a real thin skin to them. Uh, they'll have some deformities as well, a lot of parrot mouth, uh, just kind of abnormal in how they're presented. Um, and we'll, we'll see this expressed as either EDF or EDC. EDF means that they're free of the gene, and EDC means that they're a carrier of the gene. And then last, uh, not least, something that's very new is the dwarfism gene that we see in a lot of black-faced sheep now. Uh, and that dwarfism gene uh, is exactly how it sounds. Uh, there's a sheet that are being um, that are coming out and very slow in terms of their growth pattern and and they're just kind of dwarfed in terms of their presentation and not able to get uh, very big. Uh, and so we'll see that now expressed in terms of their genotype as FF, meaning that they're free of the gene. Uh, they don't carry it. They're clean in their blood. FD, where they do carry uh, the, that gene. Uh, but doesn't mean that it's expressed within them themselves. And then DD, where they are uh, expressing that gene, uh, or they could be expressing that gene, and they also carry it as well. So I know it can kind of be complicated. I really wanted to focus on that codon 171 scrapie because we see it so often. If you have more questions about it, please feel free to reach out and talk about it. It's something that maybe takes a little more time to, to understand, but something that I think it's very important for us when we're talking about uh, judging breeding sheep 
within the livestock judging realm and just in production agricultural in, ge in general. Market land priorities, again, think back to last week on market cattle priorities and market land priorities are the same. We gotta have carcass value, we gotta have function then, and then finally we've gotta have balance. And um, you know, carcass value is gonna look a little bit different uh, than what it did on market cattle from last week. But again, that's still the utmost important thing that we're looking for when we're selecting market lambs uh, and try to get them placed in the correct manner. Let's just talk about some market fundamentals first uh, for market sheep, for market lambs, especially the marketing side of things. You know, most slaughter sheep are marketed on a live uh, animal basis. Uh, there's not really many that are sold on a carcass basis and uh, sale barns are the most utilized method. Uh, you can think about some of the major players like New Holland, for instance, uh, at least uh, where I grew up, New Holland in Pennsylvania was something, and, and I think for most of us in the East, we think about that quite a bit. Um, and, and trying to hit kind of some of those ethnic markets, especially at certain time of the year, uh, where really there may be more sought after or, or thought to be uh, more valuable. Uh, profit is almost always driven uh, solely by weight, uh, not so much about how they're grading and, and stuff of that nature. Although there is some niche markets for that, for the most part, it's really by weight. Um, and, and so uh, that plays a huge role and huge, huge emphasis uh, in, in terms of market fundamentals. Although profit and market lambs is almost based solely on weight, within the livestock judging ring, we think about most of those animals, or at least within their contemporary of the class, being around the same weight. Therefore, carcass value comes into play as one of the most important factors or most important priorities that we can sort from. In that, we think about muscle and finish. And just like in all species, muscle is defined by the amount of product that that animal will yield. In market lambs, we like to think about them having a wedge type shape. We're fortunate in the fact the most market lambs are set up on a stanchion or on a rack where we can get over top of those sheep and study them down their back and out through their hip. That wedge type shape needs to progressively get wider from their shoulder back out through their hip. The reason that this is so important in market lambs is we think about their most important or valuable cuts coming from their last rib back. So in fact, they should have an extremely wide loin edge and it showed plenty of shape and expression out through their hip and down into their lower leg. Again, we're going to study muscle in the same way that we have talked about it before, where they have to have a natural foundation to them in order for them to set muscle up high. But now we really want to study for that wedge type shape and make sure that they're put together in the right manner from a muscle standpoint where those valuable cuts are coming from their last rib back. The other important factor in carcass value and market lambs is finish. Finish is again defined by the amount of external fat that's laid on an animal's body. Finish in sheep looks a lot different though than what it does in beef cattle. In beef cattle, remember we wanted plenty of finish so that they could have marbling, which would in turn enhance the eating experience for a consumer. Unlike beef cattle, Market lambs, we want them to be much thinner in terms of their finish, and ideally to be lean in terms of their compositional build. We think about lambs having a very lean type texture uh, once it's gone to a consumer for a pleasant eating experience. To give some examples of where we look for finish at, we have two examples on the far extremes from the left to the right down below. The sheep on the far left is far too finished and in reality is over is over finished and obese. Ways that we can find this or identify this is if we look right in behind the sheep's shoulder where we see a very smooth indentation. If we come back over its last rib or its rib cage, again being very wide there, and then coming back out through its hip where it comes back narrow. If we take a natural line of progression around the sheep's body, and we come all the way back through its hip, we get what we call a boat type shape. 
The problem with this boat type shape is that the fat has actually started to make the sheep give an illusion that the widest portion is right there at its rib cage. Now, if you think back to what we just talked about, the most important cuts on a sheep come from its last rib back. So the widest portion is right there at its rib cage. We can think about the sheep having some compositional type concerns. Additionally, we can identify fat on sheep from a rear view. If we study sheep from the top of their hip down to the base of their leg, they should have some outward flare and turn that comes out uh, as we progress down the sheep uh, from its hip down into its leg. However, on this particular sheep, if we study from the top of its hip down through its leg, it gives kind of a straight up and down appearance or a flatter type of appearance. Additionally, if we study in between their legs to what we call the inner portion of their leg or twist, there should be kind of a defined shape or curvature there. However, again, it kind of looks as flat or like the muscle is almost falling off. Again, we can think about this as the sheep has too much fat or finish on them and where it's a compositional concern, meaning there's not enough muscle in relation to the amount of fat that that animal has laid on its body. The sheep on the far left is far too finished. If we come to the sheep on the far right, we can see one that is much more ideal from a finish standpoint. The sheep still has plenty of lean texture or shape to it. As we can see a defined curve right in behind its shoulder, we can come back over its rib cage where it certainly doesn't read to be the widest portion of it. And then if we come back to its hip, where is the widest portion, we can see some shape and curvature there. And in turn, we get this illusion where it's, it's from the shoulder back through its hip is progressing wider as we go throughout its body. Again, from a rear view, we can see some shape and outward flare and turn to its leg and the inner portion of its leg has a defined shape where it looks like there's some sh uh, texture there to its muscle uh, and it definitely looks lean in terms of its appearance. Those two sheep are vastly different in terms of their finish and how they're put together, but I would definitely lean on the side of the sheep on the far right as being shapely and expressive in terms of its muscle pattern and being much more ideal from a finished perspective. Our second priority in market lambs is function. Up to this point, we've described a lot of pieces of function and we broke down skeletal build and what it means to be efficient animals uh, as it pertains to their body shape and fleshing ability. We want to make sure that we understand that function is important in market lambs, especially from a commercial standpoint where there's plenty of feedlots out there and the skeleton on those sheep need to be correct in order to, for them to convert feed efficiently and make money for those that are involved. From a, a judging perspective and, and from a, a, a judging ring perspective, we want to make sure uh, that we understand structure well enough uh, that we can apply that to the balance and build of the animal as most of the time in the judging ring we will have show weathers that are brought forth to us. Our third priority in market lambs is balance. Balance is still a huge player as it pertains to us in the livestock judging realm as a good number of sheep that will be presented to us will have some show weather influence. We wanna look for some of the following things that are listed on the left hand side here and I'll try to point it out in the show weather that's presented. We want to look for extension and elevation. As I mentioned before, especially on those weather dams that we were talking about, we're really starting to see a shift in focus in extension and elevation in animals. We we'll want to see them lifted up in the front portion of their skeleton to make them look like they have that, uh, at the illusion that they're running uphill. And it also just helps them from a balance and aesthetic standpoint. We can study them in terms of the height of their shoulder and we can study them in terms of the length and extension that they have up through their front end. Again, another place that we want to look for that balance, and we've talked about before, is the levelness that they present. In particular, from the top of their shoulder, back out through their hip, and how level and consistent do they stay from there. Another piece that we want to look for in terms of balance and aesthetic appeal, and those that are presented to us from a market lamb standpoint, 
is underline progression. We we'll want to make sure that they're plenty deep in terms of their flank line in relation to their chest floor. If we do that, then it will give the illusion that they're running uphill and that the shallowest or the tightest portion is right here at their sternum and the deepest portion should be at their flank line. Additionally, another component of this is how long they are or the length they are in terms of their shoulder blade. I mentioned this before that if they have a short shoulder blade in relation to their chest floor, it should look a lot more shallow and should give them the illusion that they're running uphill. This is extremely important for us to look for in those market lambs to give that trendy and ideal type look. One other place that we can look is in terms of the amount of leg wool that that particular animal has. I know it seems like it's frivolous, however, it is a trend within the industry right now and it does give them the illusion that they have just a little more circumference of foot and bone. By no means do I am I telling you that you need to go find the one that has the most leg wool, but I do think it does play an important role in the sense that it gives them kind of that optical illusion of more foot and bone. It's still, it's still important to stu study them for genuine foot and bone circumference, uh, but again, you can make mention of that in reasons. These are just some of the aspects of balance that we should look for in market lambs and things that maybe separate them and make them just a little bit different uh, on the sheep side of things uh, compared to other species. Again, I appreciate everyone that's tuned in and I hope everyone is uh, doing well at home and staying safe during this time. Um, I've left my email and phone number up here again. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to discuss things with you or explain things further. Um, there's still a lot of things that we did not get to discuss during this time frame. Uh, you know, we did not discuss handling. Uh, we did not discuss EPDs again. Uh, but those are things that maybe take more time. And uh, a lot of times I feel are better if we can have one-on-one -on -one to discuss that type of stuff. And even, uh, you know, for handling a market lambs, it's important when we have a live animal in front of us to de demonstrate that and talk about that. But uh, hopefully this gives you some material that you can study over. Again, if you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to reach out. Thanks again.